Hello everyone, welcome to another Peaceful Solution Character Education Certification course. All of you that are in the auditorium can be seated. Welcome all of you that are still coming in. Those of you that are joining online, uh, welcome and thanks for joining us once again. We're going to continue here in the fourth chapter of the Respect Unit. And once again, I hope everyone by now has gotten a teacher's manual. I know there's a lot of uh, new people that are trying to start following uh, in certain locations in Kenya and other parts of Latin America. So if you still need a book, um, let us know. The Respect Unit is not available in Spanish yet, but it is being worked on. So uh, we have a crew that works day and night on getting these things translated. But if you're interested, if you have any questions, please email us at info at PeacefulSolution.org or you can just send a message straight to the official Peaceful Solution Facebook page and we will be more than glad to assist you and if it's something that you need check with us because there might be some things that we have overlooked or we don't know that it's really uh, of importance to get it done more than other things. We have a list of stuff that we're translating into other languages and of course we're trying to get the ones done that are in the most demand but also in the proper order of teaching. And when I say that, you can already get the character unit. The acceptance unit is almost complete to where you can get that. And then we have the self-control unit in Spanish also if you're looking for that. And it would be essential that you start with a character unit anyway. That's the unit you want to start in. But you can join into these classes and you can see how these pieces to the puzzle build together. But you can always go back to um, November of 2020 and that's when we started putting these classes online and that's how long this has been going on and you can get these classes readily available you can use them in your classroom you can use them in your community centers you're more than welcome to play them and you're more than welcome to print out copies of the books people have asked are our books copyrighted they are copyrighted but we allow people to print out copies as long as they do not change the context of what's inside and they don't remove any names that have been put inside of our books. As long as they print them completely, then we are fine with that. So picking up here, uh, we're going to be on page 101, but we want to go back to our lesson plan because we're kind of stuck in a, a procedure that doesn't give us a page, and we also have a page we have to cover, a couple pages actually, and we're actually building up the mind on influences. We talked about how people are taught certain uh, things in life. We talked about racism and we talked about how cultures are belittled and we we discussed quite a bit and so did David on the last class that he taught. Uh, we all discussed about how these things affect us and these things are taught. Hatred is taught, racism is taught, all of these things are taught to people. Now if we can teach people to do negative things, we can teach them to do positive things and that's the that's the key. We need to be teaching to do positive things and eliminate all of these negative things. But here on LP4E, uh, Procedure 7, and this is the procedure we're building on, and it says explain to students that there are many types of influences, and we're going to get into that more as we move forward through this class, that can play a role in their choice to be respectful. You can also test them to see if they remember as you're going through, where did you cover influences? You've covered it in three books so far, uh, the most popular being the uh, definition there in the character unit found on page 60 but you want to test them to see what they can remember and once again we'll get into that as we get into the lesson plan notice it says ask students to predict what are some of those influences answers will vary but should include friends role models sports heroes singers movie stars the television and movies Stress that everything we experience through our sense has the potential to affect the choices we make. Tell students that one of the most powerful influences in our modern society is television. Now, of course, the television became big back in the 40s. Um, you know, it's, it's almost like we try to imagine I grew up in a life of television. Of course, back then they were huge. They were pieces of furniture is what they were. You know, they looked like cabinets. And of course, um, you know, you had the big, but it had a little screen in it, but it was a big mammoth thing. And now you get these flat screen TVs you can pick up with one hand. They're very light and they're as wide as you are tall. You know, and people today look at those and that's just a normal everyday thing. Or you have an iPad or any kind of, you know, device you can get. And it's just a TV before your eyes. But speaking to, you know, even my parents and, of course, the, the author of The Peaceful Solution, a lot of them grew up 
in a time that there wasn't a TV in people's houses. You didn't have a TV. There was other things you did to occupy your time. And I remember hearing people talk where the girls, they spent a lot of time learning to cook. And they did a lot of things in the house because there was no TV to eat up your time. There was no cell phones to call your friends. Most of them didn't even have the other phone. And that's where you turned the little ringer so the lady at the phone company could listen in to you or the man. You know, where you'd give them your little extension and they'd plug you in. But these things were not so common. And even the young men, they weren't able to get on the phone and talk to their friends either. So they did a lot of chores. They learned a lot of um, you know, skills that were given to them by the people that they were working with. And these, this is what used to uh, take place. And really, if you look at how America was built and the backbone of America, that's what it was built on. Whenever we got into a lot of entertainment and a lot of setting and just watching the box and it entertains you and you know you can watch somebody die today and they're in the next movie tomorrow or you can watch somebody you know kill a hundred people never goes to jail and you root for him the whole way you know you hope he gets the next guy and these things were unheard of you know just 40 years ago 50 years ago but our society has become now to see uh, which movie can be the most gruesome? Which horror film can be the most gruesome? Which action film can kill the most people? You know, there's uh, a film that I mentioned a while back that I think it's I don't I think it's already released out and people are already destroying their minds with going to see it. Um, but they brag about how there's a murder or a killing, is what they say, every 24 seconds is what they say. Now, I don't know how that, it seems like it'd just be a whole hour and a half of somebody killing somebody. But they said, no, there's a, there's a spot where there's no killing, but he kills so many people, it pretty much averages 24 seconds of killing. And I think, I don't, you know, I'm not for sure why you even want to watch that. Those are things we put on TV and we call it horror. You know, think about what took place in Atlanta today with another shooting. You know, it wasn't that long ago we had a shooting somewhere else. It wasn't that long ago we had a shooting somewhere else. And they just, they keep taking place. One after another, after another, after another. And there's so many shootings that aren't reported that take place every day. Here in the United States alone, these things take place. And that's the, you know, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Well, you know, one of the downsides is you get shot. Just going out to everyday life, walking in a Walmart or whatever you want to do, you can get shot. Well, we're going to talk about uh, these rules again. We, we stopped off on page 101. And, of course, these rules are influences. And most people don't realize that, that a rule is an influence. When you read a rule and it says that you must not or you should not, uh, like when you go get your driver's license, you must stop at stop signs. That's a rule. And that stop sign is there, it's big, it's red, it's got four letters on it that's supposed to be tall enough for you to see. And here in Texas, whenever they have a lot of wrecks out at the country intersections, they'll even put flashing lights on the stop signs so you will know they're there. And they're important because they keep us safe. It's a rule. And when you break that rule, not only can you cause damage to your car, um, people get killed, especially in Texas where the speed limit is 75 mile an hour in a country road or on a country road, country highway, and you pull out in front of somebody or you don't see the stop sign because you're not used to that area and you run through it, it's a pretty horrific thing to see after it's all said and done. And there's no reset button. You know, it's not like your video game where you can go back and reset it and go, oh, i got to keep that rule this time. You know, there's some rules in life, when you break them, you have to live with the consequences or die with the consequences. And that's a very horrific thing. But the question of the day, here back on page 101, it says, if there are rules guiding and instructing people toward the proper way to treat others, why do people disrespect each other in society? Well, of course, they're not following the rules. And we went over the ripple effect at the last class. We closed with that reading about exactly how these rules that govern a group of people that creates a society. And when society is adhering to these rules, you have a moral society. When, si when society is breaking the rules, you have a very immoral society. You know, and you can go online even today. You know, the threat of annihilation because one country suspects that another country was trying to assassinate their leader. And that was all over the news today. And you think about what it takes, you know, is the leader's life more important than 
you know, the, the lowest person that lives in the street. No, life is all, all life is valuable. Now, that person might play a more important role due to the job that they've been given, but all life is valuable. So whether you're trying to assassinate the leader or you're killing one of the people that are just walking down the street with bombs, well, all of that life is valuable, but we like to differentiate things in in society to where, well, if you kill one of them, you know, it's it's like when you're, when you're a soldier, it's almost like you're expected to give your life sometimes. If you go and die, well, you, you did it for your country. But nobody remembers you after that. They can put your name in Washington, D.C. on a wall. They can make a memorial to you. You know, just think about, and I'm not downplaying people that die in military or in war whatsoever. Just think about, you know, if you have a grandmother and grandfather's passed away or, you know, a dad, an uncle, whatever. You know, when they first passed away, it's always on your mind if you were close to them. But as life goes, you don't forget them, but you learn how to deal with things. And that's the people you know and were close to. Now, the people you never even met and you never even knew, unless someone tells you about them, it's just a forgotten memory. And, you know, you can go. I've been to Washington, D.C. many times with the Peaceful Solution, and I've went and I've read names on the wall, the Vietnam Memorial. I've been to the World War II Memorial, to the Holocaust Museum. We've been to all of those things. And sadly, I don't remember any names that I read, and I'm not downplaying it because none of them were people that I physically knew because, well, those things took place before I was born. And I don't know that I had any family that died in Vietnam. I know I had family that were there and fought in Vietnam, but they all came home. But there's a lot of families that can't say that. Their children died, you know, their husbands died, and that even takes place through the wars today. And... It's a value that's put on life that when we start putting that this person's life is more valuable than the other, that's when we start really breaking the rule. We need to see what we can do to preserve all life. All life is valuable, and we've covered that before. Uh, but going here, the question or the answer to this question, as we said before, is both simple and complex. Many factors contribute to how people treat others and whether or not they regard the rules that govern the behavior, that govern behavior and interaction. So some people um, don't regard rules. Some people will tell you, ah, oh, that rule's not important, not important. It's so unimportant we did away with that rule. You don't even need it anymore. That was just a rule that was created to be hard on you. Really wasn't even needed. And once again, we talked about, and I, if you're a teacher, I hope you spend time doing this, and I hope some of you have tried to look at this, Go look at the rules, the laws of the United States that you're expected to adhere to. None of us know all of those rules. You know, I, when I recently went to Peru to meet with some people, I decided I wanted to see what kind of rules Peru has that might be different than rules the United States has. And the first law that came up, it was supposed to be a, a law that brought gesture but a single man cannot own a llama in Peru. That's a law. You know, and I looked up why, and I understood why very quickly. Because it, 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 it spreads disease in society in Peru when they do that. Not that Peru endorses that, but that's a trend that started. Well, how did that trend start and where did it come from? We also have rules you know, in the United States that every year, especially in Texas, that you know, they're, they're laughable but someone created them for something. And then there's rules that you pretty much have to adhere to or you're gonna cost someone their life. You know, there was a rule in North Carolina at one time that a chicken is not supposed to crow after midnight. And I thought that's funny, how do you get your chicken to not crow after midnight? You know, if it's crowing, you had to be so far away from the city and whatever. Uh, I don't know how you train a, train a chicken when to do what it wants to do because I've heard, I've heard roosters crow all night long. I know they're supposed to do it at sun up, but I've heard them go all night long because I've wanted to go uh, eat some of them because of it. But, uh, you know, some of these rules are hilarious, and some of them are extremely important. Now, the ones that are hilarious are the ones that when people create rules because they have a problem with somebody else. They don't like how somebody else is doing something, and they're really created because there's tension between people, so they create a rule to try to restrict that person from doing something. 
And then there's rules that are created that's supposed to govern everybody to keep everyone safe. And when you think about Congress and Senate, and their job is to create rules. They don't even have to interpret the rule. They just create the rule. It's the Supreme Court's job to interpret what Congress and Senate set forth. And my hat's off to them if they can do that. I don't know if Congress and Senate can interpret sometimes because they'll argue over these rules and everybody will change and make a change and make a change. And if you've ever watched when they pass a bill, uh, we experienced this by going there many times. I mean, those things will be that thick. A bill will be. And they will hand out those bills one night and the next morning they're supposed to vote on it. How in the world could you possibly have read all of that? And we asked a certain uh, congressman from down in an area that we've taught a lot of classes in one time. I don't want to identify him because he's still in office and he's a really great guy as far as helping the peaceful solution. I asked him, how in the world do you read all of that? And he goes, what they do is, as long as what they wanted is in that bill, they vote yes. If what they wanted is not in that bill, they vote no. But they don't read the whole bill. They just want to know what they have, what they want is in the bill. And he said, we call this pork barreling. We just add what we want. He said, so what is actually being passed is about that thick. But everything everybody wanted to go with, it's about that thick. And that's how much you had to do to get this bill passed or to get this law passed. Well, when you think about how much you got to grease the palms, as a man in St. Louis told us one time, how you've got to do this to get these things done, well, this is influences. I'll vote yes if you give me what I want. You don't give me what I want, I vote no. So the real importance and the care and concern about the law that's being created is really not even there. It's about I'll stand behind you if you can give me what I want. Well, there's rules in society that were not created that way. There's rules in society that are really there with the intentions of keeping us safe. It has nothing to do with your chickens or your llamas. You know, nothing to do with any of those things. Well, in this section, we will see and explore the following three factors, and that's what people are taught. Remember, it's very important. We went through this in the character unit. We built off of it in the acceptance unit when we got into uh, differentiation and culture, and then the self-control unit. We also covered it in that people are taught character traits. You're not born with a positive character. You're not born with a negative character. You might be born with attributes that you have inherited from your parents, but these things in generally are taught to us. No one is a born leader and no one's a born assassin. You have to be taught to do certain things. Of course, of course, the choices they make, and that's what life is about, is about choices. And when we make those choices, we have to live with those choices. There's never been a reset button created to where you can do something that you know, cost someone their life or, you know, cost someone an arm or a leg and you can go hit a reset button and watch it all come back or watch the person come back to life or those things don't take place in society. When we do something, there's a lot of finality to it. And also how media influences and affects the choices that we make. You know, in society, media can be a very uh, deceptive kind of instrument when you see things take place and I know children, I have a lot of children, that have never really experienced watching violent shows, ever. And I think the most violent one they watched was uh, Grapes of Wrath. I think that's about the most violent. And uh, even in that, someone gets shot with a forty-five. And, of course, they don't show it like they do today. Today they'd have the blood splattered everywhere and the guts hanging out. But in Grapes of Wrath, they didn't show it. The officer just says, man, those 45s really make a mess. Gives you an idea that it really hurt that lady really, really bad when they shot her by accident. And then there was some things that we were watching to kind of explore. And it took me longer to explain to them that it's fake. It's not real. What you're seeing is not real. Um, and I think some of them still didn't get it. But it was a... Um, it was a part of a film I wanted them to see how vicious somebody could be treated. Um, and it was for them to see what people have been through and what people truly go through. When I say vicious, it wasn't for the blood curdling. It was so they could see these things really take place. This is real. It's not fake. These are not just made up things. People really do people like this. 
And you know, it's um, even though it was a repetition or an acting reenactment of something that took place, uh, they still thought it actually took place. Which, when you see it in the mind of a child, you, you never want to, you don't want to push too hard on getting them to act that way because it seems like once they start, they love doing it after that. Theatrics becomes part of their character, and that can be very damaging. Uh, continuing on here, it says, the first thing to consider is that people must, notice must, if you don't have that word underlined, underline it, circle it, highlight it, draw arrows to it. You know, if you can put neon signs in your book, put it. Anytime there's a must, it's like if you've ever baked bread and you left the salt out and you taste it, to me, the bread tastes horrible. You know, you can tell immediately that you left something out. Um, well, you must put it in there if you want this taste. It's like chocolate milk. If you want chocolate milk, you must put chocolate in it. No cow is going to give you chocolate milk. I don't care how much chocolate you feed the cow, the milk will not be chocolate. You know, so if you want chocolate milk, you must. So this is a must right here. The first thing to consider is that people must be taught the value of developing a positive moral character with qualities such as self-control, respect, and compassion. So if we want this to take place, it must be taught. There's no way around it. You have to do it. If you, want, if you want it to come forth, it must be taught. So people must, notice that word again, must also be taught how to have appropriate, respectful interactions. Now, when these things are being taught, you know, you remember David at a couple classes ago, he was saying, you know, prepare yourself because you're going to mess up. You're going to make, you're going to fall short sometimes. And that doesn't mean beat yourself up. And also remember, other people are going to fall short sometimes. It doesn't mean beat them up either. You know, we should be stricter with ourselves than we are with other people. Our expectations should be higher for ourselves than with other people. But we should also realize that we're all going to um, either make a mistake or a bad choice. And yes, there's a difference between a mistake and a bad choice that we will get into much later in the Building More Excellence Unit. But, you know, when making a mistake, it can be simplified as you accidentally put salt in your coffee instead of sugar. You thought you had the sugar, but you accidentally used the salt. That's a time when salt, a lot of salt, would not be too great. Uh, but once again, this is a must. It has to be taught. And with teaching, remember, value, imitate, practice. It takes time. It has to be developed. It has to be nurtured or grown. If you've ever grown something in a garden, or you've watched a tree grow, or you've had a child and you watched it grow up, you know, you have to nurture those things. You can't just have a child, you know, uh, well, okay, you're two weeks old now, TV dinner's in the freezer, microwave's over there, i got to go back to work, see you later. It doesn't work that way. You know, it has to be nurtured, it has to be taught. Even certain levels of food have to be introduced uh, to the child so it can actually develop its system because a child you know once it's born is still developing and once you get older you're still developing we're all still developing now the difference in our development you think of this remember we talked about appropriate respectful interactions that includes with ourselves, because as we develop we have to answer for everything that we do to ourselves you know and, and I know William has talked about and Katan has talked about when people are partake of illicit drugs drugs that are very destructive to the body and when you're young it seems like ah, I didn't have any problem it's only when you get older you start realizing I probably shouldn't have done all this stuff you know I shouldn't have done this I shouldn't have done that I do that with sports I played in high school back when I was in high school I thought it was a blast my body still hurts to this day the bones that I broke uh, when I was playing sports but back then I didn't really care I broke a bone I still wanted to go back in and play that was fine you know, you think that you don't you think that these things are not going to affect you later on in life, but they do. And for every action there's a reaction. Well, you see here it says, for instance, someone who grows up always hearing two wrongs never make a right. Now that's what the author of the Peaceful Solution grew up hearing. Two wrongs never make a right. But they will learn to treat others respectfully even if he or she has been treated disrespectfully. But once again, this is something that's taught. And it's not just one time, it's repetition. These things are put into the mind. Now, if, if someone said two wrongs don't make a right, and if you tell your child that, 
and then the paper boy gives you the wrong newspaper or didn't deliver on that day and you sit out there the next day when he comes by next i'm going to shoot him with rock salt you know and you show that to your child and i only say that because i read that and uh, i read that on the internet here not long ago where somebody decided to shoot the paper boy with rock salt i didn't even know we still had paper boys i thought that was a thing of the past but whenever you do this and you do it in front of your child and you create it as something that's funny well you didn't teach them that two wrongs uh make a right never make a right you teach them that when someone wrongs you well you got to wrong them back and think about the retaliation that's put within the mind well if you notice here if you're not if you don't have that in your hearing once again um but if you do have two wrongs will never make a right you will learn to treat others respectfully even if been treated disrespectfully but if it's not put within your mind you're not going to have it to access if you think of your mind or your brain as you know, think of it as a library shelf that team you can think of it as computer i've heard a lot of people that are older say i don't know anything about computers but everybody knows what a library shelf is and every time you learn something you put that book on the shelf and think of that shelf as your brain and all the knowledge that's in that book you now have it but even though you have that book you still have to open it up sometimes and go back to check to see what it says you just don't stick it in there and every page is in that database not that we can access it this time but if you never take the time to gather that knowledge to put on that bookshelf the book is never there and you're never you're never able to access it you know in prison is full of people that we've told you should have known to do the right thing but once again we've got law books this thick and well who knows what the right thing is you know there's a laughing gesture that goes on in the middle east that every citizen in the united states since we've created so many laws is actually a criminal that no one can keep all of the laws that we have possibly it's not possible you know and i'm kind of laughing because i'm looking in front of me here and i see united states code service and that's just a law book of certain codes in themselves <laughs> it's sitting right here in front of me and it's a pretty thick book in itself we probably use it as a paperweight around here because it's uh, i don't think it's probably been opened in years but you think about how these laws are there and they're created and if you don't know them you can't adhere to them but laws of morality we're talking about simplistic things these laws are laws you use in everyday life in communication being respectful using self-control uh, respecting the rights of others respecting the rights of ownership you know asking before taking or touching something you know and, and not just asking and then taking getting permission well putting all these things together continuing on here it says someone who was taught that violence is wrong and sees appropriate nonviolent interaction practice will learn self-control and how to handle problems without resorting to physical violence so they hear it and they see it they're taught it but then it's put into action with those role models or those people that are teaching them that helps them see it you know i was sent an article and you, you'll have to google it i didn't have a subscription to this news source so they wouldn't let me print it off or i would have used it but um, they didn't want to do it unless you had a subscription to this certain paper and I wasn't able to get it done in time. But you can Google this. And it says, your grudges may be killing you. That's what scientists are saying. Now, we brought that out in the Peaceful Solution a long time ago, how these negative thoughts lead to negative feelings. And when you harbor these things, they damage your organs. They actually internally damage your body. And if you've ever been in a situation where, you know, they say your heart's been broken, you know, uh, you can hear that and you think, well, you know, how do you break a heart? But if you've ever been in a situation to where you've been hurt, it literally feels like your heart's been broken. You know, if you've ever been in a situation where you think you've really messed up, you feel like your stomach's up in your throat, you know, there's nothing you can do. You can, you can actually feel it in your body. And that's what it's talking about. And, but these things work together. All of these things work together. And, of course when we damage and think about that though whenever you are hurt physically you know emotionally your body aches whenever you think you're in trouble your body aches you can feel it in your innermost body now when we do stuff to damage our body how much more is our body there to help us make decisions and to do things whenever we can feel it hurt when we hurt whenever we see something you know because we see it with the eyes or we hear it with the ears and we know that you know that's not something we want to take place in life and of course the whole body suffers well 
When our bodies aren't up to par, the whole body suffers and the mind suffers with it. Continuing on here, uh, so think about that with grudges also. And, and look that up. If you're a teacher, look that up. You can Google it. Once again, it's your grudges may be killing you. What scientists say about um, harboring grudges. And, of course, that's something that is a proven scientific fact that they're coming out and showing that it's damaging. Continuing on, it says, If people are not taught how to develop these traits as part of their character, they will generally disregard the rules that govern behavior and interaction. So that's a very important part to understand. When people are not taught the importance of keeping a rule, and they're not taught the importance of a, the application of that rule, the default is to just ignore the rule. Just disregard it. They were not taught the importance of it, so they don't see the benefit of it. Continuing on, it says, Another reason why disrespect has become a part of our society is that, generally speaking, Notice people are not forced to obey the rules that govern respectful interaction. And you know that word force can be one of the most confusing things on the face of this earth. Um, you know, force would be, uh, if, if you don't stop at the stop sign, we literally go grab you and brag you back, you know, we drag you back to that stop sign and we make you stop. Force isn't telling you to stop because the rule keeps you safe. That's not force telling you you have to stop. Force would be physically grabbing a hold of you and dragging you back. Um, look up the definition of force in any dictionary, and it, it talks about physical constraint or not allowing someone to do what they want to do within certain limits. Um, you have to be careful, otherwise you'll define these rules that keep us safe as force. And, of course, you'd never want to say that, uh, well, someone has to force you to be polite. They have to force you to be respectful. No, you're supposed to choose. You're supposed to choose. And if you don't do it, then it's not going to be beneficial to you. But, of course, we don't force people. No one can force someone to govern themselves. But when we teach them the rules and tell them that they need to be applied, and when they don't do them, we go back and we reteach them again, that's not force. That's compassion. That's showing compassion to people because, remember, that's what the activities are at the end of each chapter, they're there to help us reinforce the lesson plan to begin with. And that's why we apply these things. But continuing on, it says, although rules are part of society, they're supposed to be, it is each individual's choices, choice to obey or disobey. So each individual gets to choose. Someone in Atlanta today chose to take out their gun and shoot up a bunch of people. You know, and we have that take place about every day. Um, there was someone in Abilene, I think it was two days ago, decided to go on a high-speed chase and run from the police officers. That's what he chose to do. You know, he got caught. You know, there was someone that chose to shoot up a school in Tennessee here not long ago. There's someone that chose to drop a bomb the other day. There's someone that chose to shoot a missile the other day. You know, all of these choices affect each other. We all affect each other. And when we think these choices don't affect all of us, let someone do something in the Middle East and watch oil skyrocket. You know, it doesn't seem, if you've ever noticed, somebody can make a threat in the Middle East and oil skyrockets. Everything can be peaceful and oil drop the barrel of oil. I think it was down to $68 today up where it was 80 before. Pump still looks the same. I drove by, I didn't see the gas prices drop at the pump. Why? Because someone's going to do something that's going to shoot it right back up again. So they don't even worry with it. And of course, when you know, people, when you understand that, people think that these things change automatically. Now, I heard the author use this as an example one time. It's one of the best examples I've ever heard. That when people are taught to change, they've heard it in their mind. And when they start processing it, if everybody goes the right way, it eventually gets better and the problems stop. Gas prices are the same way. When oil drops, well, the gas is still in the you know, containers there at the gas station, that's the oil they paid high dollar for, the gasoline. So the price didn't drop on what's sitting there in the container waiting for you to come pump it out. But if everybody minds their P's and Q's and dots their I's and crosses their T's, then everything can come down. Well, it's the same way with crime. If everybody would do it, it would start dissipating. Sadly, that's not taking place. Uh, continuing on, it says, for example, People who know that stealing is wrong, raise your hand in here if you know stealing is wrong. You know, I think everybody, and the reason you know stealing is wrong because there's something you have you don't want somebody to take. It affects you personally. 
and I've I've met people in prison, and you know they they always make me laugh. Especially one guy I met in Tennessee. I asked him. I said, "What are you in for?" Oh, theft. Because I've stole everything you can think of. I've stole it. If it wasn't nailed down, I stole it. I was like, "That's interesting." I said, "So, what's your worst fear in prison?" He goes, "Somebody stealing my stuff." I thought, "Well." I guess he goes, when you're in prison, you know, because he was indigent, which means he didn't have a lot of money. He couldn't get more. And he was guarding his stuff. And he said that, he goes, you know, coming into prison, I've learned that I don't like to have my stuff stolen. But he still had not come to grips that it wasn't okay to steal somebody else's. He was still thinking if they have it, you know, they can get more. I can't. And that's not really true. But think about this statistic here. It says, yet in the year 2000, now this is 23 years ago, in the United States alone, 407,842 people were arrested for robbery. Now, these people chose to disrespect other members of society by disobeying the laws that say, do not steal or do not trespass. Now, if we can put up a slide here, the latest FBI study was in 2019, and this was off of the U.S. Department of Justice uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation website, and it's 2019 Crime in the United States. And, of course, at the very top, you'll see that nationwide law enforcement made an estimated 10,085,207 arrests. That was, of course, in 2019. Um, now, that's the people that they actually caught that did the crime or suspected they did the crime. Of these arrests, 495,871 were for violent crimes. That's almost half a million people were arrested for what's deemed violent crimes. And 1,074,367 were for property crimes. Now it says, note that the UCR program does not collect data on citations for traffic violations. But you got over a million there. And then notice here, um, you know, you had 407,842 um, robberies. Notice here, the highest number of arrests were for drug abuse violations. We see that a lot in Texas because a lot of drugs are trafficked up and down I-20. Interstate 20, estimated at 1,558,862 arrests, driving under the influence, imagine that, driving under the influence, risking taking someone else's life because you're intoxicated, over a million people were arrested. How many people you think do that that never get caught? An enormous amount. And then larceny theft estimated at 813,073. 813,073. If we can go to the next slide, just so everybody can understand what larceny theft is, the FBI Uniform Crime Reporting, also known as the UCR program, defines larceny theft as the unlawful taking, carrying, leading, or riding away of property from the possession or constructive possession of another. So it's taking, it's stealing. You know, and, and here we're working on, we look at robbery in 2000, was 407,000. We take a look uh, 19 years later, and we've doubled that. So we're not heading in the right direction whatsoever. You know, one person said, well, if you want to reduce it, just get rid of the law. So I guess if we want to reduce uh, the 1 million people that were arrested for driving under the influence, we just need to let people drive drunk. That'll take care of the problem, right? Well, no, that's a law that's needed to keep people safe. It was implemented because people were dying, because people were not following rules. And you would think, well... There wasn't a rule that said you couldn't do this before we made the rule. Well, you're not supposed to put somebody's life in jeopardy. That's what the Peace of Solutions teaching. Every time you see that somebody is harmed, you don't have to create another rule. The rule already exists. The rules of morality are already there that would govern all of these things. You don't have to pass another law and another law and another law. The rules are already there to show respect. Do not bring harm to yourself, someone else, or the environment. To never do something that could do that is enough to say, don't drive while intoxicated. You know, you don't need to pile on another 5,000 rules that generate income. I know morality doesn't generate income. There's no citation you can give for someone being too kind or too respectful. That just doesn't bring money. But these things are truly what makes society function the way we want, it, we want to see it. Continuing all the all, continuing on here, it says, <clears throat> excuse me, these people choose to, and then speaking of the 407,000 or the, uh, what was it, uh, 813,000 now, 
Uh, those people chose to disrespect other members of society by disobeying the law that says do not steal or do not trespass. Now, here's another example. You know, when you think about that, you know, uh, well, we'll leave that one alone for now. We'll address that at another time. And so here's another example. People know that racism is wrong. Do you think all people know racism is wrong? Yes. You do? You ever been down in deep south of Georgia and met with people who were raised to hate different colored people? Or North Carolina or South Carolina? Some some people think that it's perfectly acceptable to be racist. They think it's normal. And let me ask you, do you think you could be taught to be racist and not know it? You know, when you think about it, and how do you perceive, and, and I want you to really think about this as an individual, after September the 11th, how did you perceive anyone that dressed like a Arab? How did you perceive them? You know, that took place, and I know to this day, because I'm in international airports quite often, and I see a lot of people dressed, walking with their Middle Eastern clothes, uh, a lot of people wearing hijabs. I've seen people walking with hijabs. That's the women's dress. And people will look at them like they're diseased or plagued. But yet they're, they choose to do what they're doing, and they're not harming anybody. They're not bringing harm to themselves, someone else, or the environment. You know, So can you be taught to dislike someone or a group of people just by influences of others? And the answer is yes, very easily. We can all be influenced to do that. Um, so continuing on, it says, people know that racism is wrong, or they should know it, if they're taught they know it, and that there are laws against discrimination, stereotype, and prejudice. Yet people choose to disrespect and abuse others based on the color of their skin or the shape of their eyes. And I only say that because I've, I've actually been around people who were taught from their youth to be racist, and they could not comprehend why other people were not racist. It just could not compute in their mind because their father was a leader of a certain group uh, that is known to be racist, and they couldn't comprehend it. And from where I come from, that was pretty popular. I was just thankful I was raised in a family that was not racist, and racism was never taught. We were taught that racism was wrong. And... As much as I was taught it was wrong, I had someone that I knew in high school, he was taught it was perfectly normal, that you're supposed to be that way, that anybody that doesn't treat it that way is diseased. You can't do it that way. It has to be. These people are the scum of the earth. You know, and, and you start taking out and thinking that the white, the white population is the only one of benefit, um, you eliminate a lot of people on earth that contribute to society, a very healthy part of society. You know, and you could be the same way if you look at it from an African-American standpoint. You think that's the only group, or if you're Middle Eastern, or if you're Asian. When you start limiting this down, you know, we as a society, are inter in we're interdependent on each other. We need each other. And society operates that way. And we learned with COVID, when you take one of those people out, you know, just take out, you know, the, the microchips from Taiwan. Take that out and watch all the major dealerships just cry. You know, everything shuts down. Well, I guess we needed that country after all, huh? And now they're ready to go to war over it because it became, well, I guess whoever has it, they have a lot of money. And then all of a sudden, South America became popular. Why? Because that's where you get the lithium for all the batteries and all the new electrical cars. So now we need to go in and we're going to have to start something down in South America because we're going to have to take over that too. You know, and you think about it, if you had something, and I want you to think about this as far as stealing and what we do as society. If you had something in your yard, you know, think of a country, because this is in a triad area uh, around Peru, Argentina. Uh, there was another one out there. It might have been Brazil, the tip of Brazil. But it's in a triad area with an enormous amount of lithium is being mined right now. And countries are getting ready to go to war over it because China wants it, the United States wants it. Uh, there's other countries wanting it because this is what they need for the electric cars they're trying to push so hard. And it's definitely needed, so they're ready to fight for it. But when you look at this, if, I, if you had something in your yard that society needed, why do you not let, why would I not let you develop it and sell it? Why should I come in your backyard, start digging up your backyard and taking what belongs to you? Well, you know, we didn't learn that with lithium. We learned that with oil. 
We've learned if we want oil, we go into the country and we take it. And if you don't like it, well, that's fine. We'll just destroy your country. Well, now lithium has become the thing that is really building. And you're going to see that a lot more in the news as it takes place. Um, people are ready to kill for these things. And you start wondering, why don't you let the countries develop their own stuff and let them sell their own product? Why not let them reap the benefits of what belongs to them? Well, if you don't do it the way that you're told to do it, you become like Venezuela. You have the world's largest oil reserve, and you can't do anything with it. It just sits there. You have to find someone that will let you sell your product. You know, But society's not operating that way. We're really hurting society with this taking by force and acting in a way that doesn't let people benefit from what truly belongs to them. We're stealing. It's robbery. You know, We prosecute people for doing it here in the United States, but what are we doing as a nation? What are other nations doing? Not singling out any certain nation, but what are people doing on a global scale? It's still disrespect whether it's done as a singular person or as a nation itself. Continuing on here at the bottom of page 101, it says, Our choices determine how we interact with others. Once again, think about this not just individually, but also globally. The ability to think and then choose based on what is right or wrong will define your character. You know, it also helps determine your reputation. Choosing to obey the rules and respecting others are choices every member of society must make if we are to live in a world that is free of the abuse and violence that have become so commonplace. So if everyone in society has to contribute to this, that also includes leaders of society. That includes not going into other countries and taking what belongs to them. It includes not going into your neighbor's yard and taking what belongs to your neighbor. You know, you have to be respectful of everyone's possessions. Continuing on here, looking over to page 102, and this will be finishing up where Procedure 7 at, because the next page we're going to get into Procedure 8. But we want to take time, and here at the very top you see that be careful of the choices you make because they can affect you and those you care about for life. And when you think about choices you make, remember we've talked about one of the most damaging things that we can do to hurt other people are the words that come out of our mouths. You know, remember they punch like a fist, they hurt. Remember, all the way back to the character unit in the second chapter, we talked about how verbal abuse is just as strong as physical abuse. And this is something we can all fall into, um, and we have to be mindful of it. Because in society, it seems to be it seems to be more common to just speak negatively about someone, and sometimes it's done just to make ourselves feel better. You know, if, if I can make someone else feel look worse than me, then that makes me feel better. It's very disturbing way but it's very common in society continuing on here it says keep in mind that being taught to be respectful and choosing to act respectfully are two different things if we can go to the next slide and this is so you can put it in your notes you can reference back to it it's page eight i didn't put the page up there but it's page eight of the character unit and it's uh, if you remember it's morals and what do they have to do with my character remember morals or rules and that's where you see we talk about that dividing line between right and wrong that's what we're talking about when we're mentioning that. And it's very important to remember that dividing line separates life and death, positive and negative, friends and enemies. It separates right from wrong. And it's all a choice. And at the very top of the page there, on page 8, it says, Regardless of culture, religion, or environment, there are some values that all people share. They're called moral values. A moral value is that, like a line that divides wrong behavior from right behavior people from all walks of life young or old big or small rich or poor share some of the same basic concepts of moral value and right below that you see that morality can be divided into three basic categories you have behavior and attitude toward all life notice that's human animal and plant behavior and attitude towards possessions and property and behavior and attitude towards the environment and, of course, the environment, as we've discussed, is much more than just trees and flowers. The environment can also be the environment of where you are at, the community, the schools, the workplace. And continuing on, remember it said that moral principles in regard to human life means acknowledging and accepting that life is valuable. And notice all people have the potential to contribute to society. 
Remember, society is supposed to be a, a group of people that live by a common body of laws or rules. When you have a moral attitude towards others, you accept and appreciate that they have the right to live in peace, safety, and security. You can demonstrate a moral attitude by being respectful towards all people. This means not taking advantage of others, but rather showing them care and concern. You know, so we started talking about respect all the way back in the very beginning, because remember, respect is to show care, consideration, and concern. Now notice an immoral attitude towards life consists of behaviors that devalue, they belittle, they hurt, and take from others both emotionally and physically. Behaviors that include name-calling, teasing, bullying, and discriminating cause others to feel inferior and disregard the worth, um, their worth as human beings. Physically hurting others includes being aggressive and violent towards them. It also consists of behaviors such as violating, that's rape. Rape is one of the most, you know, and it's important that you teach your children this, teach everybody this. It's one of the most hateful crimes, most disrespectful crimes, the most careless crime that can ever be done to someone, you know. And people say that uh, people can recover from it. If you ever have daughters, you will stand against rape. And if you have sons, you will stand against rape. It, it, rape doesn't know gender. It can be a boy or a girl. And if someone ever violates your child, you know, that's something that no one wants to experience. I've talked to many people that have suffered this. And it does something to a person that it takes them an enormous amount of time to recover from. It's not just something you, you know, you can delete all of this from your mind. It's something that you have to process. Um, but once again, killing, kidnapping, or murdering. Of course, murdering is pretty final in itself, but kidnapping also is very dramatic. All of these things uh, destroy, they damage, they, they hurt, they bring harm. They also create enemies where we should be creating friends. Looking back here on page 102, notice once again at the very beginning at the top of the paragraph, it says, Keep in mind that being taught to be respectful and choosing to act respectfully are two different things. And that's what we were talking about there with the dividing line between what is right and what is wrong. Now, influences, notice, are factors that affect the choices we make. Influences are anything that can affect or change the way we think, feel, and act. And you see right there after that, you see a role model. Put that in parentheses, underline it, highlight it, do whatever you got to do, because as a teacher of the Peaceful Solution, whether we like it or not, whether we want it or not, whether we even want to be part of it or not, part of being a teacher uh, of the Peaceful Solution is you become a role model. And as David said in a couple classes ago, as a teacher, when you mess up, that gets noticed a lot more than when someone who's not a teacher messes up. Um, because not only do we know, we teach that we should not do it. You know, And that's something that we all ourselves can fall into. And, you know, I'll remind you, if we can go to the next slide, this is something to put in your notes here, so you can go back to it when you get to this section. And this is page 71 of the character unit. Oh, let's see, what slide are you on there? Should go to the next slide. There we go. Yeah, the influences are all around us. Um, if you want to put that there for yourself, it's uh, page 60. The influence is all around us, page 60. I'm only skipping that one because we only have a short time left. But page 71 um, of the character unit, and it's Mira Mira, and it's talking about looking at ourselves, examining ourselves. And it says, with so many negative influences in today's society, it can be a challenge to obtain a positive character. This is where having, a, this is where having someone who has a moral character to imitate really helps. Imitating someone we look up to and admire. As babies, you imitate your parents in how to speak when to smile, how to eat, and so forth. You develop your habits uh, that are how you develop habits that are now second nature to second. Uh, learn to speak English, I'll do well. You develop habits that are now second nature to you. As your children grow older, you become more aware of your environment and others around you. You begin to notice things about them that you like and admire. Someone who you admire and try to emulate or imitate is called a role model. Now, there might be people that have role models they try to emulate or imitate because they're doing negative things, because they're doing things that are not so positive. Those are also role models, but they're negative role models. 
Uh, notice once again, it says a role model could be someone your age, an older sibling, other family members, friends, teachers, and that's just to name a few. Here are some things to keep in mind when choosing a role model. Notice the first one is make sure he or she is a moral person. That means they're keeping the rules. You know, that means you need to look beyond their personality. Keep in mind someone can appear to be a great person, but have a negative, immoral character. You know, I think about in society when you read about um, young children being violated. And it's in the news a lot about certain people that were supposed to be role models, teachers, people of ethics, people that were supposed to be of the highest standard. But yet you see a lot in the news to where they have a reputation of molesting and raping children. Now, it's hard to put trust in someone that's doing someone that way. And think about this. If you're a child and a person you're looking to who's supposed to be the standard of doing what is right before you, and they bring you in and they do something inappropriate to you, what do you think that does to that child as it grows older? You know, I, I, one thing that I've learned in dealing with uh, people in prison facilities and, and dealing with the peaceful solution, most people that make bad choices that hurt others this way were done this way themselves. I would say 99.9% .9 of the people I've talked to that did this to someone were done this way themselves. And it doesn't mean that a person can't change. They can change, and I've seen people change. Uh, but society, uh, society tends to define it by who it is, whether we should kill them or whether we should you know, forgive them. And you see that a lot. Uh, but of course, anybody who's ever made a bad choice can fix things. They can work things out. They can change to be positive. But think about what it does to the mind of a child when someone who's supposed to be that positive role model does something so negative to that person. And then the second thing we have here is a positive role model, role model will motivate you to build a positive moral character. So they just don't show it, they actually motivate you to do it. In other words, a positive role model will encourage you to make right choices. A right choice is one where respect is shown in your life and also in the lives of others, ensuring that no one is treated unfairly or unharmed. And that brings us back to where we're at in the respect unit, and you can start seeing how We've been teaching this throughout all the other units, but now we're in the respect unit. We're breaking it down even more. So we're putting all these pieces of the puzzle together. Then, of course, you see there at the next paragraph, it says, Becoming a person of integrity. Uh, you, too, can become a role model and influence someone else to obtain a positive moral character. And that's what we're looking to do. That's what we're wanting to do. If you go to the next slide, uh, this is for your notes so you have it. On page 64, you know, don't ever underestimate the influence violence can have on your character. And the reason you don't underestimate it, it's a scientific fact that these things we learn through repetition. Whenever someone repeatedly plays violent video games, repeatedly watch violent movies, repeatedly does anything that's breaking the morals, breaking the rules, and looking at it as though, ah, it's okay. It's something that, yeah, it's fun. You know, we're going to root for the bad guy. You know, uh, you got to watch... Um, I'll just give a I'll give a random name so I don't bring up any uh, fighting championship places. We'll say ABC Championship for fighting or whatever uh, is big money. They get in their octagon, you know. They beat the living hell out of each other. That's the only way I know to put it. And everybody roots for someone beating someone unconscious or choking them out. You know, and this has become an enormous sport, not just in the United States but all around the world. You know, and people die from these things. I remember watching people die boxing when I was growing up. But think about, you know, these other things are much worse. And they can call it ultimate all they want to. It's ultimate destruction. It's ultimate disrespect for someone else. You know, and they define respect in their own way. But you're bringing harm. Your whole goal is to bring harm to someone else. Well, let me finish reading here about the role model and finish out this paragraph, and this will give William a place to pick up on page 102 to do a little bit of rehearsal, but at least we can complete this. It says, a role model, education, television, movies, uh, the Internet, all have the potential to influence the choices that you make regarding how you respect others and yourself. Negative influences can encourage you to choose behavior that is disrespectful to yourself and others, such as experimenting with drugs, premarital sex, 
uh, or abusing alcohol. Positive influence, on the other hand, will encourage you to make choices that will challenge you to improve yourself and to show concern for others. So it literally challenges you. It puts it there so it's, it's supposed to be something that's going to be a little difficult. It's going to be a little hard, but still it's something that's attainable. And here at the very bottom of the page, you see that it, you can be influenced and not even know it. So be careful about what you see and hear. And, of course, we're going to pick up and continue about what we see and hear and go back and rehearse some things we learned in the self-control unit with uh, monkey say, monkey do, and all of those things. Uh, but we'll put these pieces together to where our students should start seeing how these things are more than just the beat, as we've said before. They're more than just some words in a song. They actually can be destructive if they're used in certain ways. So our next class is going to be this coming Sunday, and I think it's May the 7th, will be our next class. And if you can join back with us, we'll pick up back on page 102, and William will be our instructor. Thank you once again for joining us.